All right, let's begin. Uh, thank you all for coming. Good to see you here. There's a lot of you on a Thursday afternoon. We're going to talk about uh, building a culture of observability. So thank you all for being here. Uh, I do question your judgment, though, because I don't know who in their right mind would come to hear two hardcore technologists speak about culture and art. But uh, in general, though, it's, 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 I think it's a very uh, relevant topic now, because as companies and, and services are moving to the cloud, they're using microservices, containers, observability is becoming a very uh, relevant topic, a very important topic. So that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to discuss you know, what observability is. What is observability culture? Why is it important? How do you set it up? The most fun part of this talk is actually going to be by Julia Wong from Atlassian, my co-presenter. She's actually going to talk about uh, her experience, her team's experience, doing observability at Atlassian. So I think that should be fun to listen to. And then we'll follow up with a bunch of strategies that you know, in our collective experiences, we have found to be very helpful. So we want to share that with you. <coughs> So, you know, hi, I'm Arjit Mukherjee. I know the agenda says uh, Corey Watson is the presenter, and you don't need to be a Sherlock to deduce that I'm not Watson, right? Uh, unfortunately, for a personal reason, he could not attend the talk, uh, so I'm going to do my best to present his material. Uh, if you get a chance, do, you know, uh, hear him speak. He's a fantastic speaker. Uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I am an architect at Splunk, and they call me distinguished because I have a bald head and, and a gray beard. Uh, I came to Splunk through acquisition uh, of a company called SignalFX. And SignalFX is a SaaS service. We provide observability as a service for your applications and, and your infrastructure. And I joined that company because I'm kind of very passionate about this space. I've been doing it for a long time. Uh, circa 2007 and later, I was at Facebook. I helped build observability and monitoring at Facebook. <clears throat> but enough about me, so let's talk about uh, the topic today, observability. So what is observability? You know, as the name implies, observability is the ability of a system to be observed, right? So let's consider a black box complex system. By getting gathering telemetry from it, we sort of get a window into you know, its internal state. When things go wrong, uh, we might understand why that is. Consider you know, the human body as a complex system. We observe it using telemetry. For example, I may take your blood pressure, measure your pulse, do a blood test, or you know, like brain scan or what have you. It's the same idea. The idea is to understand what might be happening inside, get a snapshot, as well as analyze when things go wrong, <clears throat> why that might be. And it's obviously a much more complex topic. It's not as simple as just you know, getting a little bit of data and putting a dashboard up. It's more complex than that, and that's what we're going to talk about. One of the things that uh, comes up a lot is uh, this question around monitoring versus observability. Are they the same? Are they different? What does it mean? Uh, in general, one way to think about it is monitoring is about looking out for things that I know might go wrong, right? For example, uh, the error rate in my application might go up. I might monitor for it. Uh, the latency of my API requests might go up. Again, I might monitor for it. CPU might go up, stuff like that. Especially if you have a large monolithic system, Monitoring kind of works because you kind of know how it might fail. You might have an Agios check or something else like that, sort of looking out for the things that go wrong. But as systems get more and more complex, though, uh, monitoring stops working. So there are this class of problems which we call, they're anticipated in the sense that we know that they might happen, but they're unexpected. For example, memory corruption. Let's say a memory chip in your server got corrupted. It's having checks and errors and producing garbage results. We know that's possible, but <clears throat> we don't expect it. What if the CPU had a problem? Let's say it added 486 with 100 and came up with an answer of 585.9999. That's wrong, right? By the way, that's a famous constant known as Pentium uh, in the industry. Uh, but it gets worse than that, right? Uh, when you consider a complex uh, microservice environment, it's extremely, extremely complex. For example, Amazon's own S3 service, last time I heard it had at least 130 different microservices that are interacting in complex ways to sort of provide you the service. I guarantee you there's not a single human on earth who is able to look at all of these 130 microservices, all those interactions, and predict every way it's going to fail. It's just not done. So what do we do? What we can do, the only thing we can do is gather telemetry from it, understand the data that's coming in, so that when those unexpected errors occur, we have a way to at least analyze that and figure out what might be the case. So that's where we are solidly in the realm of observability. Now, observability, as I mentioned, is not simple. It depends on various types of telemetry. 
there's, there's metrics, there's traces, and there's logs. Uh, one brief, simple way to think about it is metrics, for example, they are numbers. They're very lightweight. I can keep them for a long time. Because they're numbers, I can easily dashboard them. I can set alerts on them. So metrics will answer the question of, do I have a problem? That's the thing that metrics are awesome for. But if you consider those 130 microservices with all those interactions, you know, errors cascade. How do I know where the problem is? Metrics are not going to tell me that, because every microservice, maybe 50 of them are, are going to send me alerts. Traces help us with that, because really to understand where the problem is, you need to understand the dependencies. And that's what traces are good for, because they're looking at transaction flow in your environment. But if you wanted to know, like, you know, what is the root cause? Like, what is that error message? What is that exception, et cetera? You need forensics, and forensics lie in logs. So high level, if you want to remember this, you need different types of telemetry, and to really have effective observability, you need all three, right? <clears throat> now, you can have all of this. You can have all this data. This is wonderful. They're getting stored, etc. But you got to do something with it, because if you don't have take action on all of this, like it's no use to you. And that's where the humans come in. I mean, somebody has to go and, and look at the data and set up those alerts. That's a human being. Somebody has to go and build a dashboard to observe your service. That's a human being. Somebody needs to you know, build these workflows and tools, et cetera, to help you with your operations. Again, that's a human being. So there is a big human aspect to this, right? So you know, people talk about the people, processes, and tools. The tools aspect is part of it. But the people and process is a big, big, big part of observability. And that's kind of exactly what we're going to talk about today. <coughs> uh, but before we get into the cultural process, you know, I would like to convince you that you know, this is something that you should care about. Uh, when there is more risk, because you know, we are working with complex systems, we are making more changes more often, when there is more risk, you, need, you must have good observability, otherwise you're not going to succeed. In short, observability allows us to operate these sort of complex environments with confidence. You know. For example, you know, I'm yet to see a modern jetliner where the pilot is kind of looking out of the cockpit and sort of making manual adjustments. Like, that's just not done. It's just too complex, right? Same thing is true here. Our environments are complex, and observability not only lets us operate well, they also, you know, when a problem does occur, it's going to help me identify what the problem is and fix it quickly, because we don't want outages for too long. Similarly, it's also going to allow me to innovate faster, because if your developers think it got your back, like when they make changes in the system, if they have a way to understand that that was a safe change or it's something that should roll back, the more confidence that they have, the faster they're going to move, the faster you are going to innovate. So this is why it, it, it matters. So now let's talk about the culture of observability. You know, if there is one thing you want to take back from this talk, take this back. Observability is like a fine yogurt. It's beneficial. It's great for you. But to get started, you really need a good culture, right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, but culture is hard. Culture is subjective. You know, it's kind of fuzzy. It's not something that you can kind of measure. If you ask uh, someone, like, you know, do you have safety in your organization? Well, I don't know. Uh, what kind of policies do I have? Do my people, are they trained on safety? Are they practicing it? So it's, it's really about a, a process thing, right? Uh, similarly, with observability, it's not just, you know, just something that you set up in a manifesto. It's something that you need to practice, that you need to design, right? Uh, that's kind of what the gist of this talk is going to be. High level, though, one way to think about it is the scope of observability is far more than just you know, incident management. So you know, I have an outage. Let me look at my whatever telemetry to figure out what's wrong. Frankly, that is a small subset. Observability, frankly, allows us to make what I call data-driven decisions throughout your life cycle. I'll give you some examples. Let's say you know, I deployed a new version of my code. Was that good? Is it working well? How do I know? Observability telemetry gives me that, right? I made a config change. I made a code change, for example, in a, in a critical component. Did it improve the performance, or did it make it worse? How do I know? Again, I can look at the observability data. Well, Christmas is coming. I'm going to get more load on my site. I need to deploy more capacity. How much should I deploy? How do I know? It's not a subjective answer. I, again, need to look at observability data, telemetry, et cetera, to make those calls. So it's frankly, it's all encompassing. The idea is to use it to make data-driven decisions. It should be a core part of the DevOps lifecycle, right? That's kind of what it needs to be. 
Uh, but before we get into some of the sort of strategies, let me invite Julia on stage. As I said, she's going to talk about her experience with Atlassian and how they implemented observability. So Julia, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Julia Wong and I currently work as a developer at Atlassian. I've been in our observability team for two years. I also recently did a talk at the first GopherCon Australia about how we built a metrics pipeline using Go. And outside of work, I volunteer for an organisation called the Gold Programming Network Australia. We aim to provide gold all across Australia in high school with the opportunity to participate in free and fun technology workshops that teach them how to code. We started off a couple of years ago in one classroom in Sydney, and we now run workshops all across Australia. At Atlassian, our mission is to unleash the potential of every team. We do this by providing software like Jira, Confluence, Bitbucket, Trello, and OpsGenie to help teams collaborate and work together more efficiently. Today, we have more than 150,000 customers using our products all around the world. And within the observability team at Atlassian, we're currently 20 developers and growing quite fast. We're spread across both Sydney and Mountain View. When I joined the team two years ago, we were half the size with 10 developers all based in Sydney. Now, Earlier this year, we had a big project that involved us migrating to SignalFX as our monitoring vendor. This was by no means easy, and to give you an idea of the scale we're operating at, I've got some numbers for you. So we're sending roughly 1.5 million metrics a second. That's definitely not a small amount at all. And during the migration, not only did we need to consider the thousands of dashboards and detectors we needed to migrate, we also needed to consider over 2,000 developers and SREs we needed to train in how to actually use SignalFX. Without knowing how to use SignalFX, which is absolutely critical for our everyday operations, we'd effectively be flying blind. Then on top of the scale we're operating at, we also had the challenge of six months to complete this migration and only five developers on our team working on this project. We also decided to use these six months to address previous issues we had in our metrics pipeline to make it easier for us to maintain and support. So one of the issues we had was that we had multiple ways that our developers could send their metrics into the previous vendor. One of these pathways was via one of two metric servers. Now, the tricky thing is that each of these metric servers have a slightly different behavior. One metric server will persist missing metrics for up to 20 seconds, whereas the other miss metric server won't persist missing metrics at all. One metric server will aggregate all of the metrics over a 10 second time period, whereas our other metric server only aggregates data over a one second time period. And so as you can tell, we had to, be, we had to really be across the intricacies of each metric server and the behavior of each. And this also became a factor in why a user's metric might not appear how they expected it to be. And then the other way for metrics to get into the previous vendor was going straight to it. Unfortunately, this meant that we had a lack of insights and control over our data. And it was often a bit more difficult to debug in this case because we didn't have a service sitting in the middle. And so with this migration happening, we decided to address this issue by creating one brand new path that looks something like this. So in this new path, you'll notice that we now have one metric server. This eliminates the need for our team to be across the intricacies of each behavior of different metric servers. So that problem solved. You may have also noticed that we've got a brand new service called our metrics proxy. Our metrics proxy gives us insights and control over our data. It gives us information like how many metrics are being sent per request, and what are the size of these requests we're sending. We also get more control over our data through what we call a metrics block list that sits in our metrics proxy. Pretty much any metrics that sit in this block list are dropped and not sent to the vendor. This has come in handy quite a few times when we've had metrics explode in cardinality or metrics containing personally identifiable information. In order to get our developers to move to this new path, we decided to take a carrot approach. We gave our users an incentive to move. We said to them, if you want your metrics to land in SignalFX, you need to send via this new path. 
This meant that anyone sending via the old path was stuck on the previous vendor, and they had to explicitly move to this new path in order to get their metrics inside SignalFX. Now, another issue we decided to address with the migration to SignalFX was our prior lack of recommendation around a configures code tool. With our previous vendor, we never had a specific recommendation for our developers. Rather, our messaging was more like, go find a configures code tool that suits your team. Unfortunately, that meant that it was on our developers to go out there, investigate all the tools, and choose one for their team. And we also saw our developers starting to roll out their own solutions, and we continually saw the wheel being reinvented. By the end, there were like seven to eight different solutions in total. And this was really difficult for our team to support because we were only familiar with one out of the eight. And so with this migration, we decided to take the opportunity to go out there, research all the configures code tools for SignalFX, and choose one. We ended up choosing the SignalFX Terraform provider. And whilst our developers are still free to use whichever one they want, we now at least have a recommendation and something we can tell our developers that, hey, this is the tool we recommend you use and this is the one that we'll support you with. Now, during the migration, we were able to provide support to our developers through a Slack channel, just solely dedicated to helping them migrate to SignalFX. We noticed that a common misconception was developers needed to move their dashboards and detectors into SignalFX and make them look identical to how they did in the previous vendor. Unfortunately, this meant that they were missing out on the chance to review what value they got out of their dashboards and detectors. And it also meant that they were assuming that the data they had in the previous vendor was correct. In fact, we found that quite a bit of the time they had incorrect aggregations applied, meaning that they were getting the wrong information out of their data. So helping our developers migrate to SignalFX was much more than teaching them how to use a new system. It was also about getting them to understand what value they wanted out of their metrics, as well as their dashboards and detectors, and teaching them when to use each metric type and which aggregations. One nice thing about having all our developers in this one channel just solely dedicated to migrating the SignalFX was that our users started helping each other out with their questions, which was great for the five developers on the observability team. One nice thing that also happened was that our developers started writing their own blogs about their learnings from SignalFX, and they also started running their own brown bag and knowledge sharing sessions, which was awesome to see. At the end of the six months, once we completed our project, we reflected on our experiences and thought about what we'd learned and what we'd do differently next time. So the first thing is that this project was entirely a lot less technical than we thought it would be. Even though we did have the part where we consolidated our metrics um, pathways, it was a lot, of, a lot of it was about just how do we support our users and how do we teach them best practices. Another thing we definitely underestimated was how powerful it was for us to embed with teams. We ended up sitting with, um, we ended up having one person from the observability team sit with another person from a different team for a day just to get them started with the migration. And we found this was really powerful. It then enabled that person we sat with to go and become a multiplier and teach the rest of their team how to use signal effects. Unfortunately, this is only something we started realizing towards the end of the migration. And if we were to do it all again, we'd definitely do it at the start to impact a greater number of teams. The next point I have is forcing functions. So we were getting close to the end of the migration and we wanted to stop sending metrics to our previous vendor. However, we didn't know if anyone was still using these metrics or if anyone was still in the process of migrating. To overcome this, we asked for all teams who were still using this data to raise a ticket with us. And the benefit that we got out of that was that we were then aware of who was still migrating and who we could offer assistance to. And we identified teams that we needed to follow up with closer to the deadline. And finally, if we were to do it all again, we'd have migration champions. Now, this isn't something that we did at Atlassian. However, when I spoke to Corey when we were writing this talk, he mentioned that at one of the previous companies he worked at, he had migration champions and that it was really effective. 
The idea here is that we want to have a migration champion from each team. And we leverage the existing influence these people have on their teams and their organisations and get them to help us cheerlead the migration all the way through. So whilst we were busy working on the migration to signal effects at the start of the year, that's just one of the many things that the Atlassian observability team has done. I'm going to share how we make observability easy in Atlassian and how we use some of this data. So we were aware that we had a bunch of unused metrics contributing to our total metric usage quota. This wasn't great because we need enough um, headroom for the growth of our systems. So we needed a way to figure out how to reduce our metric usage. But we also wanted to use this opportunity to raise awareness around this too. So in order to figure out which metrics to drop, we thought back to our monitoring bootcamp, which is our introductory monitoring bootcamp class at Atlassian. And that's where we teach our developers if a metric isn't being used on a dashboard, if a metric isn't on a dashboard, then you can consider it as not being used. The idea here is that you want to make it as easy as possible for yourself and your teammates in an incident. And you also want to reduce the amount of tribal knowledge that exists on the team. Chances are, if you get paged at 3 a.m., you're not going to remember that one single metric you need to plot. Instead, you're going to remember which dashboard to visit with all the metrics you have already on there. And so we got a list of the top 5,000 metrics that were being used and wrote a script to cross-check if each of these metrics were being used on a dashboard. If they weren't being used on a dashboard, we added it to our metric block list back in our metrics proxy. And we also shared this list of drop metrics with all of Atlassian. We were able to reduce our usage by close to 50%. What's also awesome is that when I spoke with Corey, he mentioned he did something similar in one of the past companies he worked at, where he helped raise awareness around the amount of unused metrics. And he also had a result of 50% too. So at Atlassian, we run what we call a monitoring bootcamp which teaches our developers how to monitor their systems in Atlassian. It's typically taken by new starters, and it's also a requirement for JIRA developers in order to obtain what we call their JIRA chopper license. This chopper license allows them to skip normal change control processes. In our bootcamp, we cover the life of a metric. So everything from how a metric gets emitted by a service through to what our metric servers are actually doing when we say they're aggregating the metrics, and then how we visualize our metrics in signal effects. The idea here is that we want to make it less of a black box and give as much power and information to our developers so that they can make the most of their data. A common question we get in the observability team is, what should I be measuring and what should I be alerting on? So in our bootcamp, we also cover a range of best practices that can be applied to multiple services. For example, one of the things we teach is to alert on symptoms rather than causes. Symptoms are more tightly correlated with user-facing functionality, whereas our causes don't necessarily mean that user functionality is broken. For example, a symptom could be the number of error pages that our users are seeing, whereas a cause could be CPU is at 85%. And finally, humans learn by doing, so our bootcamp is hands-on. We've made sure that it's as practical as possible to give our developers the opportunity to get their hands dirty. By the end of the bootcamp, they're able to create a dashboard and detector and signal effects, and can then and go apply this knowledge back into their teams. At Atlassian, we have this concept called you build it, you run it, where developers own everything about a service from developing it and through to running and operating the system. To help us build a culture of reliability and improve the operational health and maturity of our services, we have this framework called TechOps. TechOps gets us to move away from being reactive and gets us to be proactive by identifying operational areas we want to improve. We call these areas our operational goals. And the idea here is that teams choose two to three operational goals they want to improve. This can be things like the number of actionable versus unactionable pages over the last week, or it could be something like the availability or the latency of your service. Once teams have set their goals, they also define how they're going to measure each goal and what success looks like, so they know when they've met their goal. 
And then each week, teams will sit together in a meeting where they'll review a generated tech ops report. And this generated tech ops report will contain their operational goals and a bunch of other information that they should be reviewing. This includes any SLIs and SLOs they've set on their service, which are measures which indicate how a service is performing against its expectations. They'll check to see if their SLIs and SLOs are on track or at risk. They'll also review a list of all the alerts they got in the past week to give them the opportunity to review whether each was actionable, whether any need tuning or removing entirely. And finally, any outstanding issues from past incidents are also included in the Tech Ops report to highlight to teams anything they should be prioritising. And so the idea is that over time, teams will reach higher and higher levels of reliability through continuous improvement. And the operational goals that they had set earlier will also evolve over time as the needs of the team change. And finally, we have our platform at Atlassian. It's an internal platform as a service that sits a layer above AWS, and it provides our developers with a variety of things for free to make it much easier for them to deploy and operate their services. This includes making it much easier for teams to adopt observability tooling. For example, every service that's deployed on our platform gets a pre-configured SignalFX smart agent to collect system metrics like CPU and disk, as well as a metric sidecar to send custom metrics to. The nice thing about this is that our developers get this for free. They don't need to worry about configuring it or running it. They can just rely on the platform to provide, to provide it for them. And all they need to do is just start sending their metrics. Another benefit that we get out of this is that we know that the configuration of the SignalFX smart agent and the metric sidecar is consistent across all services running on the platform. One neat thing that has been added to our platform recently is that every service gets a bunch of generated dashboards for free. These are automatically created and tailored for the resources each service is using. For example, if I have a service that's using DynamoDB, I'll get an automatically generated dashboard with a bunch of DynamoDB metrics that I, that I care about. Another neat thing is that if my service has any defined SLIs or SLOs, I'll also get a dashboard with this information generated on it. The idea here is that we want to minimise the amount of work it takes for our developers to get up and running and give them something to make them become operationally ready faster. The next thing that our developers get for free is a bunch of pre-configured alerts. These alerts have already been set up to route to the correct Ops Genie teams, and once again, they're customised for the resources that the service is using. They'll also cover a range of default error scenarios. So going back to my example earlier, where I have a service running DynamoDB, one of the alerts that I'll get for free from the, from the platform is when there have been more than 100 fright throttling errors within the last 10 minutes. Of course, these thresholds won't apply to every case, so our developers are free to configure them as they see fit or remove them entirely if they don't suit their service. And finally, every service deployed on the Atlassian platform gets a free uptime check for their health check and their deep check endpoints. At Atlassian, we have an internal monitoring tool called Pollinator. And Pollinator will check if services are reachable via their configured endpoints. If they aren't, they'll send an alert through to the relevant team, so they become aware that their service is down or degraded. Another neat thing that Pollinator gives us is a bunch of free metrics about whether a service was up or down at that time, and these metrics flow through to signal effects. This then allows our developers to correlate the data from Pollinator with their own custom application metrics. And that's me. I'm going to hand it back to Arjit to share some of his observability experience and wisdom with us. Thank you. Thanks, Lydia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Awesome. So uh, this next section is about some, you know, some real-world strategies that you know, Julia described a bunch of them that were kind of very, very helpful and very interesting. So we're going to distill some of that. This section is sort of based on our combined collective experience, you know, Julia's mind, Corey's, us also, we talk to a bunch of customers, prospects, and so on. So we have kind of sense for what's going on, what's working. 
So these are practical examples of strategies that we think are useful. It's also a framework for you to think about how to set up observability within your organization. Your mileage may vary, but again, these are things that have sort of proven themselves in real life. So one question that, that may come up is, should I have an observability team, right? So to answer that, let me sort of mention this. In my opinion, a, a very a good way to think about observability, think of it as a product or a service that you are making that you're trying to sell to your internal customers, right? Almost like if you want to make a product or a service, you need a company, right? Because they, it's their job to build the product, to make sure the product works, to improve it. Similarly, I think having a team is very useful. And a lot of these things I'm going to talk about later, if you think about it in that concept, I think it'll start making sense, right? Unfortunately, obviously, the, the, this internal startup within your know, company is not going to go IPO. So there's not going to be a financial payout, but the payout will be the form of the company being able to innovate faster, moving faster, and so on, So it's, which is good for you. So I think that's the payout. In general, the reason, I think, unless you're super small, in which case, obviously, you cannot have a separate team, it behooves you otherwise to have one or some number of people organized in a team to think about observability. The reason is, this is the team that's going to be able to think about things holistically, so if you just let observability practices just sort of bubble up like weeds you know, across your environment, it's not going to be very systematic. I mean, it might work initially, but it's not going to be very successful overall. So it takes a set of people to make it their problem so that they're considering it throughout all the time, not only selecting building tools, but also figuring out how they want the culture to be. So having a team is very, very effective. Now, there are some potential downsides to it, of course, for example, you know, if it becomes somebody's problem, then it's not my problem. So others may stop worrying about it. They may also sort of just keep visiting the team, like, hey, I have this problem, I have that problem. Can you help me fix it? Uh, this is an anti-pattern to watch out for, because what, what would end up happening is if this team is just buried, just handling these kind of support cases all the time, they won't get a chance to breathe. They won't be able to go up and, again, look at things from a strategic higher level. So, you know, they say, you know, give a man a fish for a day and you, you feed him for a day. Otherwise, we teach him how to fish. That's exactly the concept here. The goal of this team should be to figure out holistically how do they want observability to be within their organization. So, how do we get started? How do we start uh, observability within an organization? Let's look at some of the ideas. As I mentioned, it cannot be something that sort of just grows sort of organically. It needs some kind of deliberate design. Like, you should think, like, why, why do I want to implement observability? What is it that I want to get out of it? Is it move faster, fewer incidents, both of them? I don't know. In general, you should have an opinion on what is it that you are getting with. Otherwise, how would you measure your success later, right? And you also need to understand or figure out like what kind of user experience do you want your users to have. So if you, for example, have information architecture experts within your company, use them, talk to them, help them uh, figure out. One thing also to look out for is, again, because this is such a complex field, uh, you can get buried in the weeds. So there are so many potential corner use cases and so on. You may sort of make something that's overly complicated. Watch out for that. Don't do that. Ideally, you know, it's the 80-20 rule make the common use cases very, very easy, and make the complex use cases possible. I think that would be one good way to think about it. A useful, easy to use tool is one that's gonna have adoption, right? Uh, how do you get adoption? So let's speak about adoption. Obviously a successful product, a successful service, observability, uh, the more successful it is means there's more people using it. How do you, you can't force people to use it, so how do you, you know, encourage usage? Commonality is a, is a great concept to use, for example, the more out-of-the-box value you provide, the better it is, the more people are going to use it. And this is something that I have seen across the board. Corey has seen it as, you know, at Twitter and, and at Stripe. I have seen it at Facebook, Signal Effect, like all over the place. The more out-of-the-box value you provide, the better it is going to be. For example, if you build observability into your application stack, that's great because now anybody who writes an app, a new service using that application stack is going to benefit from it, right? So this will means that they will probably not want to go and use something else because they're not getting that out of the box value. Similarly, if you had support for well-known services and things that are used within the company in terms of you know, alerts or dashboards, Julia again spoke about a few of them, that is again great because again, I did not have to do anything. I just, just by virtue of using the standard things, I'm getting that value out of it, right? 
Uh, one thing, other, other thing I would mention, which is I think quite relevant here, especially in larger organizations with multiple teams, multiple uh, verticals and so on, one of the things you'll find is, you know, person X who's working on a, you know, service A, they understand what's going on, the, the how to read observability dashboards, et cetera, in service A. But if they were to look at somebody else's dashboard, they would have absolutely no clue about what's going on because they are doing their own thing in their own way. This is an anti-pattern to watch out for because what that does is it makes it sort of much more siloed and you cannot help yourself. Uh, you have to always go ask other people. Standardized structure, standardized formats, et cetera, is brilliant. It's a thing that I think you should strive to have. Again, we've seen the advantage of that many different times. For example, let's say you know something is called a host in your logs and an instance in your metrics and a node in your traces. That's not a good thing to have, right? Ideally, you want interoperability between your different data types. So again, some kind of a deliberate structuring is helpful there. Uh, another pod, uh, way to do standardization is you might say, and this is something a lot of the Google SREs are you know, talking about with SLIs and SLOs and so on, is regardless of whatever application I have, I must have a standard way in which I monitor them. I must have some declared SLIs. I must measure them in a particular way. The more standardized you make things, for example, things like red metrics, et cetera, are also another example of that. The more structure, common structure you have, the more utility you're going to get out of it. And it's the job of the observability team to sort of set the tone for some of these. But you can do all of that. Again, you can you know, build all these wonderful tools. You can get all this data. But unless people are aware of it, obviously, they're not going to use it. You know, our startup, it needs to do marketing. Otherwise, how will people know that you know, it's out there that is building this wonderful product that I should buy? Similarly, you know, when, you, when you join a new company, you go through boot camp, right? You understand you know, how the company works, what are the different processes. The same should be true for observability. Again, Julia talked about how in Atlassian, they are doing this educational. So I think education is something, again, as part of the culture you need to invest in. So for example, when new employees join, they should go through some kind of an observability boot camp or observability training where they understand what's out there. This has two really, really nice advantages. Again, I, I said culture is about people. So when you have these new employees come in and have a session with you, you're building those human connections, right? So they know you, you know them. They know where to go to ask questions. They're, they're no longer like lost at sea, for example. So this, this human connection is very, very critical. And obviously, the other thing that we all know is new employees are wonderful, unbiased feedback providers, right? So they want to say, you know what? I saw this happen in this other way, or I really understood this part. Or, this doesn't make sense. Whatever the case is, that feedback is critical because we need to, this, this startup of observability needs to be viable. It needs to react, right? So education is important. So again, in short, to summarize, if you want to start a culture of observability, be deliberate about it. Have a point of view on how you want it to be, how you want the user experience to be. Provide as much out of the box value as you can provide, because the more you do, the greater is going to be the intake. More people are going to use it. They're going to like it, right? And then you need to educate, because without education, they won't make most out of it. So you need to invest in an education program. So now you know, my startup made a product. Uh, it's sort of selling. Users are using it. Uh, how do I make sure that it continues to be viable? Are my customers happy? Because without customer satisfaction, my startup is bound to fail. How do I maintain this, right? Few things. People, if they're using your product, they're going to have problems. There must be a very straightforward, standard way for them to seek help. Because unless they have that, they're going to not feel confident about your tool. They're going to start looking elsewhere, right? So standardized ways of providing help is important. So Julia talked about Slack channels. This is something that's, again, very, very, very popular. It's seen that in many, many different places. You could also have a standardized ticketing system where you know they know how to go and ask for help. That's important. But remember, though, that they're not going to contact you for every possible issue, every possible problem. Your tools are going to have problems in the wild. The more you can be aware of them, for example, through instrumentation, et cetera, where you can be yourself aware even without them opening a ticket, that's great. Another fantastic example of this is uh, personal touch. So this is something that Corey's team did at Stripe. What they would do is uh, the observability team would go and on a schedule, like go and meet their user teams. So they'll say, you know, what's working for you? What's not working for you? How can we help? 
this will actually surface a lot of different issues that they otherwise would not have reported. But more importantly, it tells your users that you care, that you have their back, right? This kind of trust is again very, very important within our organization. So this is something that I would also highly recommend. Sharing your wins and successes. We all want to use a product that is vibrant, that is, you know, making improvements that I'm aware I'm excited about, right? Uh, that is also key. Unless you have a way to talk about your wins, talk about the developments, etc., how will your users know? So sharing is an important part of observability culture, right? So announce, for example, we used to do a lot of tech talks uh, back at Facebook, or you could have, again, uh, education uh, as part of this. You could have announcements that you do. But you need to sort of constantly share because you need to keep people in the loop. Another concept to use here is champions. So, you know, like the confidence with your tools is going to vary across your organization. There will always be those users, some users, who are going to love what you're doing. They're going to be your power users. Those are the guys to utilize because marketing or, you know, getting the word out works best when you have people amplifying your message. So if you can find these champions, if you can engage with them, they will be a wonderful resource, again, for your program to get it going. Practice, right? This is not something that's entirely in your um, control, but as an organization, again, I said, with this modern world, with DevOps practices, the more data-driven we are, the more faster we move, the better we are. I gave you a couple of examples earlier, right? For example, when I'm deploying a new version of code, I should use observability. When I'm making code changes on a, in a critical component, I should use observability. When I'm doing capacity planning, I should use observability. If I want to understand cost in my environment, again, I should use observability data. So management in general must like push down the fact that as an organization, we want to be nimble, we want to be objective and not subjective, we want to be data driven. So this is something that again, part of the culture is very important, is to promote the practice of it. Because thing is, this is also gonna make people not only work more efficiently, but you don't want a person's first experience with observability tools to be during an outage. They're gonna have absolutely no idea what to do. They're gonna be frustrated. They're gonna have a bad experience. They're not gonna come back. We don't want that, right? We want them to be familiar with it, right? For example, Julia talked about how at Atlassian Education, like it's a very hands-on experience, right? That is kind of what you want. You want your people to be comfortable with these tools. Feedback, of course, right? Uh, you need to know how things are going. People have the voice. They, they need to tell you how things are going, whether you know, things are going well or not. Feedback is important, right? Now, because it's an internal startup, like you have a lot more ways to get feedback than perhaps what a company with their customers do. So for example, simple surveys, quick questions, work wonderfully, don't overcomplicate it, right? Get simple questions. One of the uh, wonderful ways to do this is to embed it into the product. What do I mean by that? For example, you know, some applications have this thing called a rage shake, where if you're having a problem with the application, you just shake your phone and then it says, here's the error reporting screen, send me the uh, error. That's very lightweight, it's fun. Another one could be, you know what, I got an alert. Uh, maybe it has a thumbs down and a thumbs up icon next to tell, asking me, did you find that useful, right? Simple things like that are gonna provide you with a lot of interesting feedback, but investing in this feedback is important. Uh, as I mentioned, reaching out to teams, talking to people is also another fantastic way, again, because you're gonna get a lot of in interesting feedback that you would otherwise not, right? So feedback is important. So in order to, again, to, to summarize, if you want to maintain this culture, we started it, now how do we maintain this culture? We must make it so that people are able to come for help, ask for help, so that they're happy with the service. We need to share our wins, share our updates, announcements, because otherwise they're not gonna know. It's, again, it's like you're competing for mind share like everybody else. You need to make sure that organizationally people are practicing it on an ongoing basis, perhaps on a daily basis, helping make data-driven decisions with this data set and you need to get feedback, right? Now, feedback is used for improvement, so that's, that brings us to the topic of improvement. Uh, no product, uh, if it doesn't evolve, if it doesn't improve over time, is gonna be viable. After a while, it's gonna die, right? So we need to improve things uh, continually. What do you improve? What is it that you need to improve? How do you find that out? Fundamentally, it's about finding the gaps, like your product, your observability solution, your practices, are gonna have gaps because you're never ever gonna build a perfect system. 
how do you find those gaps? So typically what you will find is if there is a product gap or some, some kind of use cases that you're not supporting, then your users are gonna manually solve it. And 10 users are gonna manually solve it 10 different times. That is wasteful, nobody likes to do those kind of things. So the idea is to identify what those gaps are and as quickly as possible to make them part of your solution. So make that easy, right? Uh, the more automated stuff you provide, as I talked about earlier, the better it is, right? Now, getting this information can sometimes be hard. Obviously, you're capturing feedback. Feedback is a great way to identify some of these gaps, or they're gonna ask you for innovative you know, feature requests. But another really wonderful strategy that kind of works in real life is to sort of be present in those critical moments where observability is very important. Outages is basically what I'm talking about. So let's say I have an outage. The people are hustling, bustling, they're trying to figure things out, they're you know, maybe chatting on Slack or meeting in a meeting room. That is where if you participate in those discussions or if you watch those channels, you're gonna find the frustrations or the problems with the tools. Like what is it that they're not able to get? What is it that require, requires some expert to go do a bunch of things? Those are the things that you want to, because those are the things that are critical moment during outages is what you want to make easy. That's the goal of observability, among other things. So be part of those discussions. If there's gonna be a post-mortem meeting or an incident review after the fact, attend those. Basically, integrate yourself with these kind of processes within the organization. That is going to be very, very awesome. Another thing is you know, about getting your users engaged. So if you want a viable long-term business, you want your users to be passionate and supporters of you. Like, let's think about Apple. Imagine their users are such big fans of that company, of their product, which is why they're having so much success. The same is true. We, we, what we wanna prevent here is this us versus them, like there's an observability team and there's everybody else. No, it is everybody's tool, everybody's using it, right? There's a shared fate. So the more we can involve our users in these processes, the better it is. A concrete example is, you know, pull request. So if somebody wants a, an improvement in a UI or some kind of small change, why do they have to come to you and ask for it? Can they not do a pull request and just send it to you so that you just accept it? Now they have a, uh, uh, you know, they have some skin in the game. They just deployed something. You can even announce it and you can celebrate it. So they start getting more and more involved, right? This is fantastic, right? Uh, another thing, you know, this is something that I've seen in, again, many different Companies, you know, Google has this 20% uh, time off. I don't know whether they still have it. Facebook had this thing called Hack a Month, for example, where we would go and work in a different team on some project for a month, or somebody from a different team would come and work with us for a month, working on our projects. These are ways that you can cross-pollinate. This is not something that just benefits observability, of course, but various other things. But the idea is of this, of this shared fate, that it is our tool. The more you can learn from others, get others involved, the better it is, the stickier it is, the more everybody will want to use it, right? Finally, measure. Uh, observability is about measurement. People are using your observability tools to measure their systems, their services. Well, by golly, you should measure your own uh, service with it, right? And that's kind of very, very key. Because if you don't measure, if you don't think, make things measurable, how do you know how successful or not successful you are, right? You need to have your own goals that should be measurable. For example, do you know uh, how many users within the organization are using it? How often are they using it? How much content are they creating? How many incidents has your tool really helped with? Things like that. So, Unless you have these kind of you know, measurements in place, it'll be very hard for you to understand like the level of impact and so on. So this is, again, very key. Measurement is not just numerical. A lot of times you need to also understand the good, both the good and the bad, right? If you only look at you know, uh, t tickets where c customers are complaining or users are complaining, that's gonna give you a biased view. Ideally, you want to both learn the good and the bad, understand the successes as well as the failures, because as sort of CEOs or management of, of this sort of internal startup, you need to have a holistic view. You need to have a way to prioritize what needs to be done to make your service better, your product better, right? So measurement is very, very important. So again, to summarize, we talked about setting up a culture, we talked about maintaining it, and now we're talking about improving. You improve observability by finding those gaps, by lifting them out of the mundane, basically automating them away, right? So that people are not having to reinvent the wheel over and over again. You try to invite, you try to engage your users into this tool. The more 
you engage them, sort of as a, you know, as a footprint, you're growing, you're getting things done faster, are you getting more lobbyists for you, so to speak, this is great because then you know, things just move along better. And then you're also very, very capable of understanding you know, what's going on, how people are using it, you have concrete numbers, you have objective ways to understand your success or failure, right? So those would be key sort of to have that viable company going forward. So to summarize, again, observability is important. It's very important because we are living in complex times. We are, we are running complex machinery. Without observability, we cannot do that efficiently. So observability is important. It lets us move faster. It lets us innovate. So you need to think about observability. But observability is not just tools. It's also people and processes. There's a lot of humans involved. Humans mean culture. So you need to be very deliberate about how you approach observability. You should have a team, perhaps, that's looking at this holistically within the company, that is figuring out what kind of observability culture do I want to have? What are some ways I can promote it? We discussed a few of them, right? You need to invest in it. In an observability program, you need to train your users so that they're aware of what they got. You need to build commonality so that they're getting a lot of out-of-the-box value. You need to make sure that your organization is making data-driven decisions with your observability data so that people are sort of familiar with the tools. They are not just using it for outages. They're using it for everything, right? And then you're also viable. You're a viable, vibrant business in the sense that you are able to see where the gaps are. You're able to find out where you need to improve. You're able to measure it. You're able to improve it, right? Again, culture is extremely subjective. Every organization is going to have a different culture. I've seen that everywhere. The same is true for observability. But the idea is to have one, right? And then pick and choose the ones that work for you. But I think if you do that, you will find that it will pay benefits in droves. Because really, like, you'll find that everybody just becomes more efficient. You just move faster. Your company does well. It can bring a lot of benefits to the table. So that's what we had. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, you know, hopefully you have a good rest of the conference. And we'll take questions offline if you have any. Thank you.